name is Victor Kitson, and I'm here in Los Angeles uh, for the Apollo 8 Foundation event at Exchange last night. I got Mark Pledger with me here. How are you, man? I'm doing very well, thank you. How was uh, you played last night? How was it? It was absolutely fantastic. It's been a long time since I've had such a great full-on trance uh, experience in L.A. like that. It was just for a Thursday night. That could have been a Saturday, a Friday, anything. So it was really, really well done, really well done. We'll go into your set as well, because you actually played a very, a very special set with the Mike Coughlin. But um, the Paul Wade Foundation is a brand new foundation. What are your thoughts on it so far? I think it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's the sort of thing where, you know, like if I can just give like a couple of sets a year, you know, it's, it's at a great time. And I've made, we've made money for charity and for good things. So I'm happy about that. <laughs> what, um, what kind of impact do you think it can make? I think that you know over time it could become an event that just purely people will you know like will flock to like any other big brand, and from there perhaps bring in sponsors that you know that really kind of just mean that you know it's it's a big event where everyone's having a great time and making a lot of money for charities. Do you have any um, charities that are close to your heart? Um, that's a really interesting question because I mean uh, I was thinking about which charities I was going to publicly announce. And you know what? I'm kind of doing a little bit more research. Um, I used to support the uh, Halo Foundation, and I still, I still may well do. It's a foundation that basically set up by Princess Diana to uh, get rid of the landmines and explosives that have been dropped and littered all around the world. And I think that's still what I'm going to do. But it's quite often the case is that, um, people will you know, pay themselves a little bit too much, yeah. like at the top end of the charities. And uh, Angelina Jolie, she actually pulled away from this as being a figurehead of this because the, the owners were like earning like, I don't know, 120000 each, like, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. But I'm going to do a little bit more research just to make sure that the charity that I pick is as, uh, is right for you. as yeah. streamlined as, you, you know, as the Apollo Aid was. Because with Apollo Aid, you know, I, we're, we're all working together to try and make as much money for something good. We're not trying to put it in our pockets. So that's, that's, that's what I think charities should be about, and that's why I'm you know, happy to work with Apollo 8. I'm happy to do a little bit more research so that the money we raise actually goes to the right people and not to the, the corporate pockets. I have to agree as well with the Apollo 8. It's a fantastic organization to work with. If we go um, into music, what was it that made Mark Pledger want to produce his own music? Um, to be honest, ever since I was about six years old, I started listening to things like uh, Jimi Hendrix and a lot of the old rock classics. Um, I, I always loved, um, I guess, the air guitar in the bedroom, <laughs> doing that kind of stuff. But it really, it was just always about, I, I, I want to be doing that. I want to be playing that. Um, so from an early age, I remember my, I twisted my mother's arm to, um, to get me some keyboard lessons. And we, so I started doing like keyboard where I'd learn covers of... TV hits and we would sequence them on Cubase that could only record for like three minutes. <laughs> so I did that and then I had a four track and started engineering bands and doing learning guitar and it just all kind of escalated. But it was just always, you know, I love music and I want to be able to make the same cr creative output really. And that's that, I had that, it's a bug I've had since like six or seven crazy but <laughs> what was your uh, what was your favorite tv cover or film cover to, to play when you were young oh, you had one where you were like standing play like pretending you're playing an egg guitar just well, doing that on a keyboard because my my pia uh, piano teacher he, he had his traditional pianos but he also had all these keyboards and i learned i didn't do piano lessons i did keyboard lessons so i was playing everything from like the a team and all these kind of tv hits but i'd say that the, the most fun one that sticks out in my mind would probably be uh Chariots of Fire. <laughs> that was pretty cool. I pr may well have that on a tape cassette at my parents' house somewhere. That would be cool yeah. to, to go back to it now, right? It, it would be, but I find a lot of these old tapes and things. I remember like, I had a, um, an old VHS He-Man video that I had when I was a little ki kid, and I put it into the machine hoping to bring back some of those memories. and Because <laughs> the tape gets old, so yeah. hopefully it'll be all right. But I do have like a... T I mean... Yeah, there's, it's a lot of the um, demos I made were also on the four track, which had a tape cassette back in the day, and it, you know, so there's a box full of them. Maybe they're going to work, maybe they're not. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. We uh, we take a step forward. Um, how did music move on from there? Um, 
Well, it's kind of a funny story. I mean, I, I, at a very early age, was kind of like trying to be in bands. Um, and I was in a, a very youthful band. Um, fifth, we were all 15 years of age. Um, there was a club in a town called Bedford in England where they had all the big bands coming through. And we knew the owners, so we could just about get in. Because uh, you had to be 16 to get in. 18 to drink in the bar, unless you're wearing something that means that you look older but um, anyway we went there a lot and kind of got into the, the indie scene and started doing a band um, we got noticed by an, an American manager um, he used to uh, manage a band called A which not many people know but they're kind of fairly big in America anyway he got us a deal with London Records and three of our tracks um, so we were going to be a big a boy band that can play instruments <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of. It didn't actually work out. Um, for an, what, yeah, what happened? Well, um, we were really good at um, doing the songs and writing them, but at the time my voice was breaking, and I was trying to sing these songs, and it was just it was all over the place. So the manager was like, "Okay, we like the songs, we like the music, so we're going to have auditions." And because we were backed by um, Warner, Warner Chapel Publishing, which is a big publishing company, and uh, London, London Records, uh, they paid for a big audition advert in a, a national magazine called Smash Hits, which is like the biggest magazine for like teenagers and like pop music and all that kind of stuff. So we had this huge audition at Pineapple Studios in London, which is where the Spice Girls and various other the, those types of acts yeah. started. And... Um, yeah, it was a very funny day. Like all these people queuing up. They didn't know what they were auditioning for. <laughs> but um, yeah, we had like some crazy people, crazy stuff. I mean, there was one. There was I don't know if I really should say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. There was one guy that had a beautiful voice, so beautiful. We were we were, we were wondering if he needed a doctor. <laughs> just let you let the rest go in your mind. But that, it was just it was a beautiful female voice. But we need a dude to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And there was uh, actually there was this the singer that um, we actually chose. He was just like the like the next Tom York. He had a very good Radiohead sort of sound. And you know what? Like the the business business side of it, they were like, no, we don't like him. We like this guy. And this guy was like an all rounder kind of cheesy pop guy. Anyway, we said okay, we'll do it. And we went into recording our EPs. And the guy got a hernia. The singer he got a, he got a hernia. And had to pull out. And you know what? Like, the whole thing unraveled. But I got a substantial amount of money in publishing. And that paid for me to eventually go and get my own equipment for my band, which helped me then get into university. At University of Westminster, where I met um, Above and Beyond and all these other guys, Oliver Smith. Yeah, was that like your trans contact came at uni? Or yep. <clears throat> with these guys? Or with the... Well, my first day of uni, um, see, my parents wanted to get rid of me, so they had the weekend where, you, you know, like you, they wanted to uh, drop you off. So they dropped me off on Saturday. Most people, they dropped off on Sunday because uni was starting on the Monday. But Jono um, from Above and Beyond, he was from uh, Devon, so he came very far, so his parents decided, you know, dropped him on Saturday. So anyway, we found ourselves in this student flat, just me and Jono. So I met him for the first time, and there was no one on campus. How old were you guys back then? Ooh, probably like 18, something like that. I think, yeah, 18, 19. I think Jono was 19 because his birthday is September, maybe. Um, anyway, so, um, yeah, we just went to the, the Union Bar and had our pint of Crest Lager, which is, not many people know what that is. And yeah, we just had a, got bonded together because there was no one else there, and uh, the rest is history. So we, we just ended up in the same flat, and uh, the, the opposite flat were very good friends, and, and that's just really how it started. Was he into trance back then, or did you guys find it like at the same time, or how did that work? Um, I think Jono was very much like, at the time, he was doing more of a mixture of things. He was very much, he was doing electronic music, he was doing kind of, I don't know if you'd like me to say this, but kind of garage style stuff, house stuff, and stuff that was leaning on trance. Because at that time, trance was starting to kind of really get into the com more the commercial market, like 98, 99. And I was going up to Gatecrasher with my buddies, and he, you know, I, I was uh, getting really into that. And I bought the, uh, I think it was the Red album, the second compilation they brought out. I remember John I was just absolutely loved it. 
and he really got into it and he just you know that he was away with that he was like starting to write trance tracks that you know blew my mind because at the time I was still a rock musician you know I wasn't even a dance producer nothing um, when I came to university there was 300 students three drummers I came to university to hope to to find a band yeah, to, cr to create a band yeah, we sort of did find music right yeah, I did find music but the reason I got into dance music not just because I was going you know I was clubbing and I was enjoying the scene but because I couldn't find a drummer and John said to me is like well, why don't you get like a sampler so I got this some um, Yamaha a3000 sampler <laughs> and John gave me a 15 minute lesson in it And the rest is history. I, honestly, in those first 15 minutes, I think I learned so much. I learned how to use Logic, MIDI, and a sampler. And I was just programming my drums. Because I was, I was sick of like, trying to find a drummer. So I was like, okay, I'm going to... Yeah, now you can do it yourself, yeah. right? And just bit by bit, I just realized that the control that you had as an electronic music producer, you can just do everything. You don't have to rely on people. I mean, the amount of bands would be like, they would be uh, bitching at each other like, oh, such and such didn't turn up today. It's like... We're going to have to get rid of that singer. There's always people being late and the agendas and student parties and all these things. But, you know, I would come back to my room and I would lock myself in. And then, and then in the morning, I would still be, like, producing my tracks. And John would wake up for his lectures and I'd be taking out my evening meal. <laughs> he, he will admit to that. That was a very funny sight, having a steak pies at seven in the morning. But that was my, you know, I'd stayed up all night. Crazy taste. We, uh, we take a big leap forward, uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. What is Mark Pledge you're working on right now? Um, well, um, I'm... Let's go musically first, because yeah. I know you have label and everything, but let's talk music first. Musically, um, I, I, I kind of have to just say something about the label just quickly, but um, the last couple of years I've been remixing for my label, Melodical Music, a heck of a lot, purely just to kind of really get kickstart it. So I did a lot of remixes, um, and now that the label's got going and we have like a real rich... Um, pool of artists and people that are willing to remix I don't have to do quite so much um, so now I'm really just concentrating on finishing all of these singles that I've I mean it's like people say to me it's like you haven't put out many singles it's like I write a new single every week really you right, you were yeah why not because they're for me <laughs> now I'm even more curious actually so it's I have a lot of stuff that I could finish and, I, and you know Every so often I do put one out, but I, I kind of, I've been on a musical journey um, trying to improve my production skills and just because a, a lot of the new music now has become so technical from when I was doing trance, um, you know, back with Smith and Pledger that, you know, I've had to reinvent myself a little bit and I've had to learn a lot more. Um, it's just got so much more technical, but that's so fantastic because of the way that the mixes are sounding now. Um, anyway, in 2016, I've got probably like three or four singles that are in a queue on my label to be released. They're all kind of um, fairly different. They're all kind of trance-based. Some are more trancey and some are more techno. Um, but yeah, you're, you're going to start seeing Mark Pledger back on the scene with his singles rather than just remixing and being a label boss. I can't wait for that. Yeah. What is, I mean, the tracks that you make for yourself, are they like... Um, experiments or, or what do they sound like like if you make a track and you I don't know you want to make it you have no intention of like making a track that you're going to release but you make a track for yourself what does that sound like uh, it's a bit like when you go to like somewhere you've never been before and you decide to go off on your own and just explore and you know sometimes there's melodies and ideas that you know they're not going to work on the dance floor but I still have to put it down <laughs> and maybe one day you're going to remix it. But, I mean, I, I have a, le a lot of singles that could be released, but I'm just looking for that new thing, you know, my, the new Mark Pledger sound. I'm still going to always do the kind of old, older traditional trance stuff because I, I love doing that, but um, I've just been primarily focusing on this new sound that I'm about to unleash. <laughs> What was it like to, um, to go into being a label boss um, from being a producer? Because it's like the other side now, right? Or it's very, both sides. It was very educational. Um, purely from like working with other labels and sympathizing with you know, what, what they're doing and understanding a little bit more about how everything works. And, um, but it's, it's been very fun. I, I was fortunate enough to... Uh, my business partner is a fairly famous 
uh, graphic designers, worked with a lot of uh, big people like Sean Tyers and uh, John Askey and Eddie Halliwell and all these people. Um, so I paired up with this guy because I had plenty of people that wanted to start a label with me, but I'm looking for someone with an asset. And what better person than a graphic designer that's really good? So we just came together uh, and started Melodica Music. Um, because, you know, you have an investor, they give you a certain amount of money, that runs out. Design bills keep coming. Yeah, true. Now you have a designer in-house, right? Yeah, basically. And we just now, we're like a team of about four or five people. But we started, like, I think it's about three or four years ago. And now we're on our 45th release coming up. Uh, from the 50th one, we're going to release our first compilation, which will be later, probably after the summer. Cool, cool. How would you, like, in, not in general, but how would you describe the sound of the label? Do you know what kind of sound you're looking for, or do you know when you hear it in, in like, promos or stuff? I literally know when I hear it. It's, 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 it's very simple. Do I like it? Do I not? Um, I don't care if it has dubstep influence to it. I don't care if it has trap influence, all these things that people in the pure trance industry think is yeah. ultimately yeah. disgusting. Um, you know what? I like pure music. I like hybrid music. You know, if I like it, I like it. I'm not going to go into the politics. Oh, that's a dubstep noise. I can't play that. That's music. You know, yeah. if, if, if you feel an emotion from, like, like basically, if I feel something from it, I like it. Whether it be like beautiful melody, or an aggressive beat, fuel your fire, you know, like, that's what I look for. Something that really just, you feel it. There's so many trance tracks out there where it almost just feels like, okay, we're going to go to this chord. Might go to that chord. This one, and then back to the start again. Yeah. And there has, there is not an emotion there. It's, it's, it's just literally template or something I don't know but there's people out there's a lot of people out there that do have the emotion because a chord change is an op opportunity to show an emotion a chord on its own only does so much but it's when you pair two chords that just and then give that emotion and then it's all of a sudden it's like yeah I like that track. I like your I like your thoughts on this because you come from a different time now it sounds like you're very old but you're not it's actually like I'm 10 years yeah, exactly, like that era. No, but like early 2000. There's a lot... In the, in the electronic scene, it feels that way, but no, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know what you mean. But you're like early 2000. A lot of people are coming out like a couple of years ago. They haven't really been through the original, I want to say classic trance phase. How do you look at new producers uh, today? Um, I think they need to be a little bit more patient. I think that they need to be a little bit more mysterious. I think with the age of social media, it's great for promotion, and it's, it definitely takes down those boundaries. But, you know, when I was growing up, if, if you know, like, uh, say, one of my favorite bands was Metallica, if I could just go onto Facebook and start talking to Metallica, I don't think that they would have been so mythically special to me. Um, I think that basically there's a lot of talented new artists out, but... You know, as soon as they get the artwork to their track, they're posting it on Facebook. And it's like, oh, look, a picture. What does that sound like? Yeah. And then, and then people wait like two months before they hear a SoundCloud thing. And, and it's just like, oh, I just wish that they would be a little bit more reserved, a little bit more kind of, you know, bring a little bit of a wall. <laughs> you mean not hype everything or, or not give away everything at the... Uh, right away, or like you know, like give away. You know, if you're gonna if you're gonna post something about music, make sure they can at least hear it. Because I see so many pictures, like oh, look at the new artwork. This is you're gonna be able to hear this in in eight weeks. Yeah, it doesn't say anything more than it's just like well, it's a it's a nice artwork. <laughs> it's got your name there and everything. <laughs> I know what you mean, actually. I know what you mean. I know I'm being a little bit cruel, but um, but no, there, there, there's some there's some fantastic new producers out there. I keep. Uh, I keep stumbling into great people that, that eventually, uh, you know, I find out they, they're old Anjuna Beats fans and suddenly they'll start doing remixes and releasing for my label. Um, there's um, uh, it's actually a post that I did on Facebook. Um, it's a, a guy called Keywork. And he had a track that was so amazing. Like about, I think it's only a year ago it came out. And I, I remember just um, randomly seeing, seeing the YouTube video for it. It's like, oh, I just played it. And there's like 26 views on the thing. 
And I was just like, wow, this is such a good track. So anyway, I did a post just saying, you know, this is an amazing track. You've got to check it out. Like three hours later, it was like 150 views or something. So this guy is like, you know, like, oh, he was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then I started getting demos. From him? Yeah, so I've signed two of his tracks. One of them is with a guy called Mr. Andre, and one's a solo track. I, I, can't, I can't 100% say the titles because I'm actually signing a heck of a lot at the minute. But, um, but yeah, it's, I, I love how that kind of works. It's kind of like, I, you know, that feels good. It's interesting. I really want to hear more about, about that guy as well. But in, do you have any tips to give producers that are sending in tracks to, uh, to labels? Now, since you're on this side as well. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, just, just make, sh make sure you send something that's relevant. I mean, occasionally I get sent stuff that's so, like, com completely, like, different genre that I couldn't, I couldn't do it. But, um, I don't know. Don't saturate people with stuff too much, you know, like, just do, just do the, because some people, like, they send you, like, eight tracks or something, and most, most of the big labels are like, oh, that's effort. <laughs> I'm not quite like that yet. But um, but yeah, there's there's a there's a lot of lot of good stuff being sent in, so it's all good. Let's um take a step back in time to uh 2000, 16 years ago. Tell me about the first time you met Oliver Smith. Well, I met Oliver Smith through Jono. Um, they kind of came became bunnies, and he just suggested that we work together. So we gave it a go. Um, I remember being in his tiny little student flat that I was in the the previous year. Um, and we just kept doing it. Um, I was I was amazed with how clean his mixes were compared to mine because at that time, although I've been writing music since a very very early age, my production was you know it was getting there, but it wasn't as good as his. And you know I I, I learned so much from working with Oliver Smith. He's he's just his mixes were always just so I don't want to say digital because we all want to say like analog and warm, but I mean, digital isn't just like, Perfect. Yeah. yeah, it was just, it was just like, and it, and it became something where, you know, I really look forward to, to working with him and we did three singles and, um, funny enough, they, they felt at the time, they felt a little bit ahead of the scene of what it was doing. I know that sounds a little bit arrogant, but we were really pushing. And the reason why I say that is because we sent these demos out and even to, and Juno Beats, they weren't up for it. Oh, they weren't even Jono, even though he set you guys up. He was... But three years later, they said, you know those tracks? And then they put out, and that was forever. Wow. <laughs> That's a cool story. So you were actually, like you said, a little bit, tiny bit before. Yeah, so what I'm so, going back to what I was talking to you about earlier about my own productions, it's like, I write all the time, and it's not to say that I'm not going to suddenly pull out a bag that I wrote three years ago. Because, I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing boundaries. I mean, sometimes I don't do that, and you just end up with something classical. But, yeah, always, always pushing forward. But, um, yeah, so with, with Oliver, we did uh, that single. Um, we also, um, I think we did, this is really testing my memory, but there was something that, um, there was a, a single called Into Deep, I believe, which wasn't or wasn't released. I, don't, I can't remember that. Yeah, there's that Smith and Pledger that's unreleased. Possibly. It, it, well, it's not unreleased because um, Matt Hardwick was a prolific kind of um, resident with Gatecrasher, and he loved this track that was sent to him. I, I think that it was sent. I don't know who sent it to him. So long ago. Anyway, he liked the track. He wanted to put it on the, the, the his Gatecrasher compilation, and I think that kind of spurred it all because he then wanted to do a collaboration with Smith and Pledger. So that's how Day One came, and and uh, you know Matt Hardwick came to our bedroom studio and sat in our bedroom studio next to the bed yeah. <laughs> and the speakers <laughs> you know I'm not going to make out we're in some like huge studio because we weren't but it was fun and uh, you know we had we had our little lunches with with uh, with, with uh, Matt Hardwick and got in this studio <laughs> did all that anyway it, it went perfectly well and and Junior Beats loved it and they signed that and I think that's why they kind of met perhaps looked back at some of our older demos and thought you know actually we're going to release this too and that's just how it kind of spiraled, really. So I can thank Matt Hardwick, and I can thank John O'Grant and Anjuna Beats, and of course James Grant too. Cool. How did it feel to uh, to go solo? What was that like um, compared to eating pies and beans with with someone else, like 24/7? Um, to begin to begin with, it was very lonely. I have to say, it was a little bit kind of like 
all of a sudden, you know, you, you, you don't have your buddy there to kind of like, you know, ask questions. And, it, and I don't think that the, this was, this was around the time where like my space was the thing. And it was a very long time ago, kids. <laughs> it wasn't quite such, I can't believe I'm saying that, like, but it, it, it wasn't so like where you knew so many people that you'd quickly, because at the moment I have like a lot of good friends where I like bounce ideas, like, what do you think of this or blah, blah, blah. I just think that, I mean, the great thing about social media is the fact that it brings a lot of producers together and we can learn off each other and share certain things and samples. And, and it's, you know, we, we, it's, it's nice to work with other people. You do le learn a, a heck of a lot from working with other people. You know, work, working with, with Ollie and with Mike Coglin, you know, I, it, I, I'd say that my three electronic music tutors to a degree would be Jonathan Grant, Oliver Smith, and Mike Coglin. You, um... I think I learned the most from Mike Coglin, technically. Because that was a time where I was like, okay, it's time to pull my socks up and start getting some clean mixes, some really clean mixes. And I think that, you know, Mike really helped me towards that. And I thank him dearly for that. You played um, a back-to-back -back set with him last night yeah. and a Juno Beats uh, classic set. What was that like? That was really fun. I mean, we haven't seen each other for like four and a bit years now. So it was just like it was a perfect reunion night. Perfect. Couldn't have gone any better. We both... Mix didn't make any train wrecks or anything like that, so and the crowd loved it. I, I really can't fault last night. It's been, I mean, usually like I, I nitpick. It's like that track. There was this little like 30 second moment where I think that maybe I should have cut that out or something. But no, tonight was we we uh, we did it good. What did you think of uh, of the crowd last night? They're very knowledgeable. They knew the tracks. I mean, I, I went back to some tracks that so-called Anjuna fans don't even know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> I played uh, Alt F4 plus Alt F4, and that's one that people are like, I've never heard of that one before. And it's like, yeah, but you remember it now, don't you? <laughs> it was a great track, that one. And I also played um, the uh, Sonny Lax Bluebird, the Daniel Candy remix, another, another classic that I love. So, and then I played a few of my tracks, too. It was uh, a fantastic night. It was so cool to hear the tracks being played out. It's been a while since I've heard those tracks. I, I still play them out. I just don't play them in such a, a block of classics. I mean, like worldwide. I mean, I think that I think I played that maybe eight months ago or something like that. Like every so often, I'm you know I definitely bring them back because when people come to see me, they're hoping that they hear like Forever, Amsterdam, Northern Lights, <laughs> uh, Time Stand Still, Fallen. You know, like the, yeah. the, the usual suspects. So I, I I don't like to do a gig where. I don't deliver what somebody's coming to see. You know, there's, there'd be nothing worse than me doing, like, you know, people coming to see the Anjuna Beats classics and then me playing melodica music classics, as though it's my label. Bad move. Yeah. Give, you've got to give the people what they want. And if you can educate them at the same time or give them something, what I mean, uh, show them something new, not educate, uh, then great. But uh, that's, that's why I kind of like, I definitely still mix the old, old with the new. I might have to remaster. I mean, a lot of the tracks that tonight I remastered to 2016. I mean, there's, there's only so much I can do, but I have the wabs and just, just made them a little bit louder, a little bit punchier, and, and that worked really well. So sounded really, really flat, fresh. Um, what else can we expect from from Mark Pledger in uh, 2016? Oh, in 2016. Well, like I said to you, I mean, we're kind of. I've been primarily focusing on on my my record label, Melodica Music. Um, it's a. It's obviously the the long the long way of doing things. You can sign to Ahmad or on Anjuna Beats, and and you'll get you get on their their tour wagon. But really, I I kind of after doing that and having such an amazing time, I want it to be my brand. I'm, I mean, you know, I still you know considering releasing with these other labels, but primarily to kind of bring the focus back to what I'm doing on my label. You know, because melodica music is is free. We don't we don't um, put boundaries for people. It's like oh, like I was uh, um, saying to you earlier about um, dubstep and these sounds. It's like if you make me a really good track that I like, I'm going to put it out. I'm not going to say well I like it, but I can't put it out unless you take out that one little sound. I mean mix problems, yeah. You know, like we have a um, 
I have a mastering engineer that's, that's absolutely fantastic that's now taken over the label mastering, which gives me more time to focus on my tracks because that's what I was doing. But he's doing a really good job of working with them, and yeah, it's, uh, it's going well. <laughs> Cool. I can't wait to see what you got coming up as well. Uh, one final question. Um, tell me about your relation to uh, Buffalo Bill. How the hell do you know that? Well, um, my granddad um, told me that my great-grandfather was related to Buffalo Bill. So there's a bit of cowboy in the family somehow. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much for your time, man. My name is Victor Kibson and we're in Los Angeles for the Apollo Aid Foundation Night at Exchange. Thank you so much for watching.